Okay, so welcome to James, the beautiful Rosary Church in yeah. Belside Park, where you're going to be um, conducting the Elysian Singers in your Marin Motets mm -hmm. this evening. Um, and this is your second release on Signum, mm -hmm. also featuring the Elysian Singers. Yeah. Um, this one's called One Equal Music, mm -hmm. um, which features music written primarily in the last 15, 15 or so years. Mm -hmm. um, how do you feel your approach to choral writing and the setting of religious texts has changed in that time? Well, I've written an awful lot of music in that time, <clears throat> and uh, in those early days, right up until the time when the Elysian Singers recorded my first uh, CD. The Cantus Sagradus is tricky, uh, but the Elysian Singers sing it wonderfully mm. on the record. In fact, they're singing one of the movements of it tonight in the right, concert. Okay. Um, I decided, though, that, um, that there's a marvellous ecology of British music out there which relies on good amateur mm. singers, and I needed to create a corpus of work for that world. Yes. And so over the last 20 years or so, I've been thinking about them. And maybe the difficulty, difficulty level has dropped a little bit um, because I was aware that there were great choirs out there, church choirs, amateur choirs, volunteer choirs that wanted to sing my music but found some of the early stuff quite tricky. Yeah. So I decided to just think about some of the practicalities involved. And I think that has shaped a lot of the music that's come since. And when you say practicalities, are these sort of in terms of range or rhythms or just all these things combined? Is it more of a congregational setting of texts? Um, or hymnal sort of texts? It's. I, I would say that uh, th th there are practical issues relating to, yes, the rhythm, uh, modalities as well, uh, the, the, the intervals involved, um, how, how, how easy or difficult it is to pitch within a choir. Um, it's, it, I wouldn't say it was hymnal uh, or congregational, although I have written a lot of congregational music, and maybe that impacted as well. Uh, I do value the, the role of the non-specialist in music making, and in liturgy, the non-specialist, of course, is usually the congregation, and how do you get them to sing their prayers, and uh, yeah. can you write new things for them? And I've written a few congregational masses over the at the time we're talking about, which I'm sure has fed into how I think about some of the practical things about the voice. Cool. So uh, just on the subject of the Mass, you've said that several times, as well as the Starbuck Matter and, and two, two seconds of the Passion and the seven last, seven last words from the cross. Mm -hmm. um, are there any religious texts that you have conscientiously avoided thus far, or that, for whatever reason, that you'd like to set still? I haven't avoided anything, uh, although I do have a plan, a cunning plan, uh, to write all the passion uh, right. um, narratives if I'm spared. As you say, there are two already, there's a St John and there's a St Luke. Uh, I'm thinking about the Mark yeah. and I'm thinking about the Matthew as well, but I don't want to write them close together. Of course, I mean, the St. writing St Matthew Passion must be, setting that text must be a very daunting sort of mm. proposition well, for any composer. Well, uh, the, the ghost of J.S. Bach hovers over your shoulder um, in, any, imagine, yeah. in any setting of the Passion, and uh, I suppose that is why I avoided the Matthew. Um, but my, my Passion settings are getting smaller in, ter in terms of scope and dimension. Mm -hmm. The St. John is huge, the St. Luke is a little smaller, the St. Matthew will be smaller again, maybe just a choir organ and a couple of soloists. The, Ma the Mark, sorry, will be like that, and then the Matthew probably just four voices in the end. It's a very intimate setting. Yeah. As opposed to the grand sort of That's grand right. setting that we have from Bach. I mean, um, just, just sort of talking about sort of the weight of history on some of one's shoulders, um, your fifth symphony is it's going to be premiered this year, the Scottish Chamber Orchestra, I believe, and the 16, which is a professional mm -hmm. choir. Mm -hmm. um, that's a choral symphony t with two choirs, I mm -hmm. believe, and some soloists. Is, is that, a, again, a daunting prospect, <coughs> writing a choral symphony mm. because of Beethoven's example. How did one approach that? Well, I mean, there's, there, are, sort of there are these terrifying messages from history that really should put us off trying to write any, anything, <laughs> uh, because it's all been done so marvellously before, whether it's Bach, Beethoven, Mozart. But you're, you're right, I mean, why do composers continue wanting to write symphonies? There's a PhD thesis in that, I think. Some composers they would never think about it, others do. And it, it does maintain itself, it's uh, enduring. Uh, Maxwell Davis wrote 10 yeah. before he died, Schnitke wrote 10, Tippett wrote 4. 
uh, it's, it's, a, it's a valid concern. And what do you think is the enduring appeal of writing a symphony for a composer? <clears throat> There's something about a symphony uh, that you, you can fill, uh, that, that is a unique space, it's a large space generally, sometimes not so. Um, but there's something about the reach and perhaps the, the moral dimension of making a statement like that that, that draws composers. And um, I knew as, as I embarked on this fifth one that it was to be a symphony and indeed a, a choral symphony. Mm -hmm. uh, there are two choirs, uh, uh, 16 is the chamber choir, from which come four soloists out, out, out from within. And then the Genesis 16, which is the alumni of their training academy. Uh, and there's about 50 of them, young, brilliant choristers. They're, they're the big chorus. And in, in Edinburgh, at the Edinburgh Festival, the Scottish Chamber Orchestra, all conducted by uh, Harry Christopher. And then it all comes down to London in October, and the Britain Symphonia will, will, uh, will play with the two, two choirs. Two choirs. Yeah. Very exciting about that. Um, so I'm just going back to orchestral work for a moment. Um, BBC Scottish performing Confession of Isabel Gowdy this year. Mm -hmm. is, I think it's the fourth or fifth time. It France? might be. Things to fall. Yeah. And <coughs> that, that is the sort of piece that launched your career. And um, not that it wasn't. It was. It's, it was such so well received that piece. And how did that sort of reception change your creative process? Did it change it? I don't think the reception uh, changed anything, but yeah. it was a huge surprise for me at the time, right. a very pleasant one, I must admit. I think it was because it was not only broadcast live in the Radio 3, as they all are, um, <clears throat> but it was shown in television as well, and it, it reached an audience that wouldn't normally have listened to a new piece of music. Cool. And uh, to, give, to, to show you what happened, the day after it had been shown, it was shown on a Friday night in the BBC, uh, the next day I went to a Celtic Aberdeen game right. and uh, I was standing in the terracing as, as we had them in those days and at, at the interval I was tapped on the shoulder by another fan and who said, was that your premiere on the television last night? And when, when that happened I realised something had changed.